No, we're starting to get some people coming in. That's great. Uh, Wonderful. Looking forward to some good attendance today. All right. Yeah, the folks are coming in. Hello, everyone. They're coming in. Wonderful. We're going to give it just another minute or two. I think people are still coming in. I'm going to be very conscious of everyone's time. See a couple of names that I recognize. Hi, Chip. Good to see you on the call. And Katie McBeth. Hey, hey, Katie. hey, Katie. Good to see you. Let's see. Anand. I think I've met Anand before, too. Good to see you, Anand. Good to see you on the call here. Hello. And Renee Straza, that name sounds very familiar too. I think I've met Renee as well before. You have a very following, cool. Miles. You have a following. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I mean, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I like to, uh, I, I like to talk, and I like to try to give advice to job seekers. So hopefully, it's good advice. You know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see at the end of this, right? Denise, we uh, we didn't uh, practice our warm up act for this though. I tell you, like I <laughs> I totally left my tap shoes at home. I had this whole song and dance routine. Oh my goodness! Cha cha cha! No, I I completely left it. Well, at see, home, that's so. too bad because during your tap dancing, I could have sung. You know, gave it a little. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody say hello to Miles. <laughs> hey, were you Broadway trained? This is great. I like this. So a lot of people are coming in. This is wonderful. It's nice to see everyone coming in. Thought I'd give it a, just a, okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because I would like to be, um, you know, conscious of everyone's time. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Awesome Up Job Virtual Fair. I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, AARP, um, for this. And thank you, everyone, for showing up and giving us some time uh, this afternoon in your busy schedules. Um, my name is Denise Brooks. I am the newly hired development um, and outreach manager for Austin Up. I have been in the position for about a month, and I'm absolutely enjoying the people that I'm having the opportunity to meet and working with the Austin Up board and working with Cindy Cummings, who is our uh, Austin Up president. Uh, it's just a wonderful time. What a wonderful gift, actually, um, right before Christmas, um, that I can be able to get to work for Austin Up for 2022. For those of you who are not too familiar with us, I'm just gonna read our vision and mission statement. Austin Up's vision is to create a region that responds to aging as a dynamic rather than a stagnant force. We are all aging all the time. And we want to make Central Texas a place that supports each of us at every age. The Austin Up mission, we are a 501c3 nonprofit community alliance committed to making Central Texas a place where older adults live full, engaged lives. We work to prioritize the unmet needs of the Central Texas aging population, tap the assets of older adults to improve our community and embrace innovation and creativity in the pursuit of an age-friendly culture. We have a wonderful, wonderful speaker uh, today that I am very excited uh, for you all to get a chance to hear. I'd like for you to put your virtual hands together uh, and give a, a warm um, hello for Miles Wallace. Miles Wallace works for Peak Performers, a nonprofit staffing firm that's been in business since 1994. They staff state of Texas government agencies with office personnel, accounting, IT roles. As a nonprofit, they give job hiring priority to people with disabilities and chronic medical conditions. Miles looks at his work as changing the world one job at a time. Miles work in strategic partnerships for Peak and has a background in BTB sales, recruiting, and digital marketing. He's proud to call Austin home and outside of work enjoys hobby board games, bike riding, and swimming. Miles, take it away. Well, thank you, Denise. I do appreciate that. And hello, everybody. One thing I would actually add that I forgot to update on my bio, but uh, Peak Performance is now national. Uh, so that's really great, uh, especially for 
like uh, like Denise said, our, our job is to change the world one job at a time. And that's really how we look at it. Um, and the reason that that's so important is that people with disabilities uh, are oftentimes uh, seen for what they cannot do as opposed to what they can do. And we're seeking to change that. Um, and, you know, part of our kind of longstanding partnership with the Austin Up organization is that as if you talk to any older adult, a lot of times they will tell you that a disability oftentimes uh, comes from the course of accident or it comes of course of injury or it comes to the uh, over the course of just aging and naturally and genetics and things of that nature. So while uh, disability oftentimes affects about uh, one and a quarter working adults, it oftentimes is a little bit higher for uh, folks that uh, get over the age of 55. Um, so that said, uh, our job is to help put all people to work, but we just give priority hiring to people with disabilities. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the in the future here, but we are actually a national company and we are working now, not just with the state of Texas government agencies, but we are excited to actually be working uh, with many different private sector companies too. In fact, uh, if you know anybody, I am looking for contract managers and uh, contract specialists uh, for a local nonprofit here that helps uh, foster children get connected to families. Without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just so you can kind of see where I am looking. Now the challenge here is that I won't be able to see any of the chats that come in, but I know that Denise has my back right here. She's gonna let me know if any chats do come in. And uh, here's the thing is that uh, I'm gonna, don't worry about interrupting me. Uh, I'd encourage you to raise a hand, to ask a chat, to interrupt. Uh, there is plenty of time during the course of this conversation for you to interject or uh, ask that burning question that you have. Because honestly, the reality of it is, is that probably you're not the only person that has that burning question. And let's just talk about it right in the way. Uh, again, Again, my name is Miles and I'm with Peak Performers and we're going to be talking today about job seeking Sherlock and that is finding the hidden jobs in six steps. Uh, so as Denise mentioned, uh, I work in strategic partnerships. So that's a combination of digital marketing, but also business development, but also recruiting, as well as doing all the various different public outreach uh, work on behalf of peak performers. Uh, and for those of you who have never heard of peak performers, we are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. And our largest, uh, uh, our largest customer is the state of Texas government agencies. We have about 412 people working for the government right now. In a variety of different roles. So those roles are oftentimes about things like administrative support kinds of roles or accounting and financial support, information technology. We also have a lot of like contracts folks and things of that nature. We also have about 100 lawyers working for us right now too. So a whole host of different jobs. And here's kind of the key right there is that as I kind of mentioned back in our uh, opening section there about what is a disability, uh, a disability is anything physical, mental, or emotional that affects one or more major life function. Uh, so oftentimes it could be something as straightforward and obvious as like I'm in a wheelchair or I'm missing an arm, but a lot of times it might be inobvious about a person, things like ADHD or dyslexia or PTSD, sleep apnea depression, diabetes, hypertension. In fact, when I'm not talking to you through a pair of uh, ear pods, I'm usually talking to you through a pair of hearing aids because I've had, I have a severe high frequency hearing loss. Uh, if you have any question about that, feel free to outreach me. I will include my contact information in this right here. And I encourage any of you to link up with me on LinkedIn as well too. But our job is to help put people in professional roles who have disabilities. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of times we just automatically assume that a disability is something visible and obvious, but the, actually the majority of the people that we have working for us have invisible disabilities as well too. Now, if you wanna go and apply for a particular job, you can go to peakperformers.org. You can click on browse jobs and that'll take you to a whole list of all the different jobs that we have. Uh, you can also sort by the location and I encourage you to do that so you can find all the jobs that are in Austin specifically, but you can also search by category such as things like uh, office or and professional roles or accounting and finance roles. There's gonna be a ton of jobs that are out there and I encourage you to apply for anything that you think is a really good fit for you. However, if you don't see something that's a good fit for you right now, but you think that you may be a fit for our company down the road, I'd encourage you to go down to the bottom and click on join our talent pool. And that's where you're gonna upload a generic version of your resume so that we can reach out to you for possible future opportunities. And let's kind of move right on into the meat of it, uh, talking about job seeking Sherlock. So <clears throat> job seeking Sherlock and, 
really, I guess the biggest question that we should ask is why does this matter? Why should we be concerned with finding all those hidden jobs that are out there? Well, it's been estimated that up to 75% of jobs are not posted online and up to 80% of jobs are actually found via network. So the reality of it is, is that what you see on Indeed and on LinkedIn, uh, but also say for example, on Monster, if any of you still use that, or work in Texas, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. Uh, the reality of it is, is that the vast majority of the jobs open and close without you ever seeing them. And they're happening all, almost all via networking. And uh, it's basically based off of kind of who you know. Uh, and the same is true for peak performers too. We do post most of our jobs, but that said, the vast majority of the people that we have working for us right now came to us via somebody that they know, whether that is a past peak performers associate or whether that is somebody that, uh, say for example, uh, somebody that connected to Austin Up and Austin Up heard about the job and then they sent that candidate over our ways too. So a lot of people come via the, net, the, via the referral route. And I want to take just a second to kind of explain why this happens. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, this feels really unfair to me, right? Why is it that, uh, you know, 80% of the jobs are now out there and not visible to me? And they should all be out there and all visible. Well, the reality of it is, is that the recruiting process is kind of a murky one and I want that I want to kind of shed some light on. So first off, uh, when it comes to the recruiting process, the very first thing that uh, happens as soon as a company identifies a need is they turn to the person on their left and they turn to the person on their right and they say, well, who do you know? And the reality of it is, is that most jobs are actually filled within this top tier right here because many of us, if we are working professionals, we know many people. And so we can send a couple of targeted emails and realistically find a couple of really, really strong suitable candidates. <coughs> Pardon me. And the nice thing about this is that it's super fast and it's free for an organization to do that. It's completely free for me to send out a couple of emails and find somebody that I know within my network right here to reach out to. Now, let's say, for example, uh, that particular organization has not identified somebody within their referral network, so they don't know anybody immediately. The next thing that they're going to do is they're going to post it on their job site. Uh, and they're basically what this does is kind of extends their network out a little bit because realistically, most of the people that are checking that particular job site are people that are connected to that organization, but maybe in a more loose kind of way. Uh, and the biggest thing here is that it costs time to do that. It takes time to do that. You have to go through a formal approval process, you know, yada, yada. Um, and it just takes time to do that. Now, a lot of times this is where many jobs stop. Uh, they, for whatever reason, they don't have the budget, they don't have the time, they don't uh, want to put any more effort into it. And so all the, these jobs are just kind of lurking in low visibility territory directly on the company or organization's website right there. And so at a certain point, if it really is a mission critical role that needs to be filled, all of a sudden they are going to sign up for Indeed.com or they're going to sign up for uh, Glassdoor or all the various different other uh, sites and they're going to advertise their job. They're going to post it and they're going to advertise it. And this is not cheap. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, I believe back this information a little bit dated, but three years ago, a subscription to Monster annually for a staffing company was about $10,000 a year. And to advertise even a single job can be hundreds of dollars for an organization to do. So they want to make sure that they are uh, going about it the right way and that they really need to do that. So that's why they oftentimes are a little bit reluctant to do it. But here's the other thing too, is that a lot of times what happens is that we go from a candidate pool that's this big to a candidate pool that is absolutely astronomical and it suddenly becomes some hiring manager's full-time job for the next two weeks just to sort through all of those resumes that come in. So what I hope to do today is I hope to help give you tools so that you can find the jobs before they ever actually get posted out there online and help give you some ideas and uh, tools for researching this kind of stuff as well too. Ideally, you wanna be in the first tier in that referral section right there. Uh, you know, if that doesn't work out, then at the very least, I'd love to give you some tools so you can kind of find the jobs directly on their site and apply for them when the candidate pool is still really small. Because, hey, guess what? You have some amazing schools, um, but so do many other job seekers 
services that are out there. And there is one surefire way that you can help increase the odds of you specifically getting hired. And that is applying when there is a smaller candidate pool. I know that's kind of a weird way to look at it, but uh, you know, it's not so much as standing out from the competition, but just stand in a pool with less competition in it. All right, so my first one of the six tips that I like to throw out there to people is I like to encourage each of you to build a comprehensive online presence. <clears throat> now, when I am looking out there on LinkedIn, which I do a lot, uh, you know, I like to make the joke that there are only two types of people that use LinkedIn out there, there and those are recruiters and those are the people that are looking for a job. Realistically is partially true right there, but the reality of it, uh, of it is that the majority of the time, this is what I see. I see a blank profile. I see that ominous kind of gray figure around there. And I think to myself, is this a human? Is this a robot? Are they located here in the United States? Are they available to work? Like I just have so many questions. And the odds of me reaching out to somebody that has a profile that looks like this is very, very low. Uh, it's gonna be just that I, you know, I, I don't think they're going to get back to me. I don't know if they're a real person. So it's just, it's just kind of weird for me. So the reality of it is, is that you do want to build out your profile so that it shows that you are a real human, that you are looking for work and that you'd be excited to talk to them. And I'm going to take you just a second to kind of go over my LinkedIn profile with you. Uh, obviously, you got a lot of tools at your disposal for uh, kind of learning a little bit more about how to do this effectively. But I just want to take a second to kind of show you mine so that hopefully uh, you can feel comfortable kind of building out yours a little bit more. So as you can see right here, I've got my profile picture right here. Um, many of you may be concerned about privacy. You may be thinking to yourself, oh gosh, I don't really want to kind of like advertise myself out there to the world and put my face on it and stuff. And I get it, you know, it's kind of weird, um, but at the same time, uh, recruiters are much more likely to reach out to you if you specifically uh, have a profile picture set up. I also encourage a background picture too. Uh, oftentimes this can be used to complement your core skills because let's face it, we shop with our eyeballs. Think of it as like you are going into a chip aisle uh, and you want to buy a bag of potato chips. Well, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look for a bag that is clearly marked as potato chips. That's what I do anyway. Um, so what can you do uh, for that? Well, maybe for example, uh, if you're currently employed, you can put your current employer right there as I've done. But if you're not employed, then maybe you can do something that represents your skills. So let's say you are a Java developer or something of that nature. Great. Use a, back, a generic background right here that has a bit of Java code on it. And that way the recruiter is looking at it and they see, oh, Java code, I found the right person for this particular role. I do encourage you that you fill this section out right here. And um, I encourage you that you do uh, include an open to. So uh, this is where you're gonna kind of get that hashtag uh, open to work right there that appears on your banner. Uh, and I personally feel like this is a great idea. It's great to label yourself as available for work if you are currently without work. Now, if you're currently fully employed, then you might wanna go about that a little bit differently, but that's just kind of the majority of the people that I am talking to right here. Additionally, you uh, have an opportunity to post something, anything. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at the profiles, we're like, I wonder if this person has logged into LinkedIn sometime within the last four years. Uh, and it's really hard for us to tell. We, uh, we don't honestly know most of the time. So an easy way that you can do that is you can post something or you can like something or you can comment on something. Uh, it's, uh, it's really funny, but it's like, just have a presence out there. You don't even necessarily need to put a lot of energy into it. Just have a presence so that we know that you are a human being looking for work. Now, if you really wanna go above and beyond, I encourage you to create your own content in a way that complements your core skills and your core uh, kind of thinking. And that way, as a recruiter, if I'm looking at your profile, I know this is a subject matter expert that I want to employ. And then the final thing is uh, I definitely encourage you to fill out this about statement right there, which is uh, you can honestly just copy paste this directly from the top of your resume right there and stick it right in. Uh, and that is a way for you to just kind of label in general what kind of jobs you're looking for and what your core skills are. And then finally, include your experience too. And again, this doesn't have to be hard. You can copy paste directly from your resume and stick it right in here. 
uh, and include it all in your profile. And what this does is this means that you have a comprehensive profile. I know you're a human being and as a recruiter, I'm much more likely to reach out to you because, hey, what better way to get a job than for the employer to come and seek you out, right? All right, let's see here. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second while I reset and get back to the presentation. I wanna pause right there and see if there is any questions that people have about, about that. Building an online presence. I'm hearing crickets, so I assume that's a good thing. Yes, no one has any questions on my end so far. All right, <laughs> very good. I'll jump right back into it. All right, my number two tip is that I'd like to encourage everybody that uh, to identify your target organizations. <coughs> so there are value to using things like Dice and Monster and Indeed and Glassdoor and things of that nature. There definitely is value and I encourage you to continue applying for jobs uh, through these particular websites right here. But I think that most people miss kind of like the, um, uh, a more fundamental idea. So the reality of it is, is that if you are applying for a job on Indeed uh, for XYZ company, the odds are that that is not a unique job. Uh, odds are they are posting it because they have a very big need for that job, either right now or in the future as well. So the other challenge that comes when you actually go and apply for jobs through these various different platforms right here is that there's often a bit of a delayed effect. So what can happen is that it might take up to 24 hours or 48 hours for a job to actually get posted onto this platform, okay? And then it might take another 24 hours for that to actually cycle back to the recruiter. And it might take the recruiter another day to actually look at all the people that applied for, the, for that particular position. Ideally not, ideally it's shorter, but this is not unreasonable. There is a lot of uh, kind of just a buffer time effectively where it just takes a while for that to happen. So alternatively, and to kind of supplement your search efforts right here, what I encourage you to do is go onto each of these different platforms and to research the kinds of companies that you want to look for. Okay, so let's say, for example, I have identified that I want to work in government and I want to uh, work possibly for another local nonprofit. Great. I'm going through all these various different sites right here. I'm making a list of all my target organizations that I could really see myself succeeding at and loving working for. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go directly to their job site and I'm going to bookmark each of their job sites and stuff instead. Uh, that way I can go directly to their website and check it right from the horse's mouth, if you will. So here's what that might look like. I'm going through and I'm looking through a, a various different job postings right here. And I say, oh, I see that Spectrum is hiring right now. Guess what? Spectrum is a huge multi-billion dollar company, I guarantee you that did you not have just one job that open. So maybe if I see myself working in a, as a call center sales representative, I would add that to my particular list. But there's other ways that you can find target companies to work for as well. Hopefully, if you've been in Austin for a little while, you already have an idea of some of your target companies. But if you don't, uh, these might be some really great places to start. Uh, I often encourage people to start with Austin Business Journal. The Austin Business Journal is really good at being able to help give you ideas for the kinds of companies that got recent funding, that recently made it into the news, or that are have something going on in their business that is newsworthy. And it's also hyper-local and hyper-specific because guess what? Everybody and their brother is going to apply for Tesla. However, odds are there's going to be many, many other mid-sized businesses that you're just not aware of unless you actually go digging them out. So that's where I encourage you to go to Austin awesome Business Journal. I encourage you to go to Community Impact. I encourage you to listen to the radio, however else you happen to get your news from, and make a list of all those different organizations that have things happening, that have been getting funding, that are hiring like crazy, whatever the case happens to be, build that list and then use that to actually proactively go and outreach uh, organizations in the future and check for those jobs on their site. There is one other thing that I will share as a link after the presentation right here too. Uh, and this is basically a list of all the largest companies that are in Austin, Texas. Uh, and this is actually a really cool list right here because what it does, let me see if I, oops. 
Bear with me for just a second. Oh no. I apologize. I will see if I can kind of find that list again in the future, but. I apologize. I guess my link is broken right there. I'll have to do some uh, more digging into that. But Austin Chamber of Commerce does maintain a pretty healthy list of a lot of various different companies that are large in the Austin area. Uh, and when you kind of drill down at a local level like that, you can oftentimes get a list of many, many different organizations that might possibly be a good fit for you, and also many organizations that you're just not aware of yet. So here's the other kind of thing, and this is kind of getting to the topic of talking about how to network. So a lot of this comes down to who you know and how you can connect to people that you know. So in general, what I encourage you to do is think about networking from a lateral and a vertical perspective. The first instinct that many of us may have is we're gonna immediately try to go and LinkedIn connect with the hiring manager at a particular organization, but you may be missing out on a very valuable opportunity right there. And that is with the lateral connections as well. So here, for example, uh, I am looking at our particular company website and I am trying to get an idea of who I might wanna reach out to just to network with and kind of see who might be a good. So I've already identified peak performers as my target company, right? And now what I'm doing is I'm drilling into that a little bit further and I'm identifying various different people in here that I wanna connect with and just let them know that I am available for work if anything comes up. So. A great way that you can do that is you can connect not only with, uh, say, for example, the person that might potentially be your manager, such as Paula right here, uh, who is, oversees our state staffing services. But in addition to that, you might also scroll through and you might find other recruiters that are working in similar positions if you wanted a job as a recruiter. Now, if you take a second to kind of go and connect with each of those individuals, it's going to make it so that you... Um, have more connections within that company. Uh, and the reality of it is, is that almost nobody does this. Nobody ever goes and seeks out the lateral connection with the recruiters and stuff, but it's a huge opportunity because again, the very first thing that we're gonna do as an organization is we're gonna post the job we're gonna make it publicly available. And then we are, uh, sorry, we are going to, we are going to turn to the person on our left and turn to the person on our right and ask them, hey, who do you know that might be a good fit for this particular uh, particular job right here? If you're really feeling uh, like uh, outgoing, I encourage you to ask for an informational interview. That's where you take 10 to 15 minutes of their time, offer to buy them uh, coffee, either virtually or otherwise, and just say, hey, I'd like to get to know your role in the organization. Uh, and I'd love to tell you about kind of my current employment uh, search as well too. Odds are uh, many people are going to try to be helpful uh, at the very least. The other way that you can do this drilling in from a networking perspective and just looking at it from an outward side is you can also do some research on LinkedIn. So I'm going through and I'm finding and I've identified that I wanna work for the Texas Education Agency. Great, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and click on the people right there and that's gonna pull up a list of all the people. And I can even kind of cross compare them with the organizational chart that I found on their website. Many organizations, especially if they are a public sector, are going to have some kind of an organizational chart. And that is where you can start to see where you might be able to fit in. So if I am a recruiter, how can I find the right department in this very large organization? And how can I connect with the right people so that I might be considered for multiple future opportunities too? So again, just kind of going through that again. So you can start your research. You can do that directly on the company website, especially if it's an, a smaller organization. You can find your lateral connections and you can connect with your vertical connections and can let people know that you are available for work. For the lateral connections, I encourage you to reach out to them and ask for an informational interview and just say, hey, you know, uh, I would love to see myself working for your company someday. I'd love to take 10, 15 minutes of your time buy you a cup of coffee and just kind of pick your brain about the organization. Uh, and it will help you stand out from all the other job seekers that are out there. One other thing that I would note right here is that 
uh, I've been talking a lot about LinkedIn and that's because LinkedIn is uh, obvious and it's available and that is a great tool for us. Um, but the, the odds are, I kind of want to go back to my earlier statement in that most of the people that are using LinkedIn on a regular basis are going to be uh, folks such as um, recruiters and people that are actively looking for work too. So I would encourage you to not discount all the other ways that you might be able to get in contact with people as well too. So if you found somebody through your other research and you think that they would be a really good target contact for you to have in order to work for that organization, don't be afraid to reach out to them via email. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to them, possibly even via phone, uh, if that is the thing that's available, uh, or possibly even give the HR department a call and say, hey, I would love to uh, work with y'all in the future. Here are some of my core skills. I'm curious if you have anything that is coming up that might be a really good fit for me. Um, and of course, the easiest way that you can do, you'll hear me say informational interview a couple of times right here, because the best way that you can really kind of get yourself top of mind for uh, all the jobs that are coming up. So that way you are identified in this part of that referral network is you can meet with them in person. So uh, I know that's always tricky a little bit with COVID times and everything, but uh, I've had a lot of uh, job seekers that have reached out to me and just sent me a Zoom link or sent me a uh, uh, a Google Meet link and we connected that way and it was very pleasant. Uh, so that's an easy way to do it uh, as well at this particular point in time. My number four tip that I like to throw out to people is engage your network through multiple means. So <clears throat> kind of going back to this idea right here is that many job seekers get frustrated with the process because they perceive themselves as very actively looking for work, um, but that's not necessarily how we might perceive it, or we might just have a bit of a mismatch. Um, so this is kind of a pyramid that I put together of basically like kind of like the levels of engagement that you can do. So at the very tippy top, we have in-person meetings and right below that we have video chat. If you're able to network your way and actually get a meeting with a person, either virtually or in person, that's gold, that's fantastic. Uh, They're gonna like you that much more and your resume is going to be the first one that pops up to them the moment that an opportunity becomes available. Um, however, uh, I would not discount uh, some of the other ways that you can get in touch with them too. Let's say they're not comfortable doing a video chat or they can't meet for that in-person cup of coffee. Ask them to say, hey, can I have a 10 to 15 minute phone call uh, with you? Now below that, but it should be kind of much, little, uh, much lower right there is email. Uh, email is an effective way for getting in touch with many people, but it can struggle to really show your personality. The more that you can show your personality that you can uh, really kind of showcase yourself as an asset to the organization uh, and not just a name on a piece of paper, uh, the more that is going to be effective right there. Right below that, we have SMS and uh, instant messages and things of that nature too. So think of that as like you have their, mess uh, you have their number and you can text them or something like that. Um, Great. And then finally, we have things like you're going on LinkedIn and you're liking, uh, you know, somebody's uh, stuff. That's great. Uh, you know, it makes us aware that you exist. And I guarantee you that uh, I go through and I oftentimes will look to see who is liking the content that I put out there. Uh, but the reality of it is that you might be able to go a step further to really engage with that content and really kind of have a nice uh, kind of rapport with them. And then finally, we have indirect general communication. Uh, so that is basically where you go onto your LinkedIn profile and you post an update that says, hey, I'm uh, looking for work. Uh, that is great uh, and that is good to let the world know, but it doesn't necessarily target that person. So when you're thinking about networking, just think about how can I make the interaction as personable as possible and talk to that person directly. And that's going to increase my chances that they remember me when that job comes up. My number five tip that I like to throw out to everybody is I like to encourage you to watch for opportunities. So now that we have this network right here, they might, may not necessarily remember you, 
but you can use their network effectively to kind of watch for future opportunities that come up. Um, so I already talked about, I think that it's critical that uh, each of you right now uh, identify a couple of different target companies and then bookmark the, uh, their job search site so that you can go directly there and kind of find all the jobs the moment that they become available. This oftentimes get you in the door much faster, but there are much other ways that you can kind of find uh, different things. Now that I've gone and I've connected with many different people in the network, uh, I can find various different things. For example, with Chris Stewart right here over at City of Austin, he recently posted that they are looking for an IT corporate manager. Great, this uh, is often gonna cut to me before many of the other job seekers ever see it and I can get my resume in the door first and possibly be competing in a smaller candidate pool. But here's another way that you can do this too. So Heather uh, recently, uh, congratulations Heather, you have recently started a new position. Um, well, what if I have a similar role title or could see myself having a similar position to what Heather is? Is this now the ideal opportunity for me to go and message some of the other people that work for the company that Heather just left and say, hey, you know, I'm available. Uh, I noticed that uh, you may have some openings that have come up within your department. I would love to talk, chat with you about some of the different opportunities that are available. So this is one of those things that many people don't think to do, but you can oftentimes watch to see who is coming and going from organizations and seize that opportunity because odds are, you know, Heather may have left to pursue other kind of greener pastures and stuff, but you can use that to really kind of take the role that she left. And my final one, and then we're going to kind of open it up for an open, uh, for an open Q and A is uh, that every no is an opportunity. <coughs> so when somebody tells you no, when you uh, either finally hear back from that recruiter uh, or finally hear back from that hiring manager and the answer is, I'm sorry, we're not going to uh, uh, take you on to this position, uh, it can be really, really demoralizing. And oftentimes many of you are thinking back to a time that this has happened to you possibly within this last week and you're getting angry about it. You're, th you're immediately kind of feeling that sense of like, oh gosh, you know, that was really frustrating for me to do. I spent all this time going through the whole process. Um, the reality of it is, is that uh, especially if you got to the interview stage uh, at a particular job, the odds are they have already pre-qualified you as a likely fit for being able to do some job in that organization. So maybe you weren't a particular fit for that particular job. Maybe they canceled the job. Maybe there was somebody that had just a little bit more specific experience than you did. You will never know as a job seeker exactly why you lost out on that particular job. All that you'll hear is no, and that can be very, uh, it, our first instinct is to immediately shut down. Our first instinct is to immediately say, okay, well, I am never going to ever consider working for Cardinal Health again. I'm never ever gonna consider working for peak performers again. That's natural and I understand that, but here's a different way that you could approach this. Uh, instead of taking that no as a very firm no, take this as an opportunity to build a relationship. Um, every time uh, you get a rejection offer from a recruiter, especially if they uh, spent the time to actually personalize it to you or call you on the phone, I'd encourage you to take a deep breath. I know it's frustrating, but I'd encourage you to take a deep breath and say, Thank you very much for the opportunity. It was really quite a pleasure to get to know you. Is it okay if I keep in touch with you about multiple other future opportunities that may come up for your organization in the future? And guess what? Nobody ever says this, but this is a huge thing that you can do because they're not targeting you specifically. Uh, you know, uh, most of the time they are looking at your resume or they're looking at your qualifications, or maybe there was somebody that was just a little bit better uh, than you. You are already pre-qualified to kind of work for that company in some sense, probably. Uh, and so it's worthwhile for you to just kind of take that no and try to turn it around into a maybe for the future. And then what you can do is you can be on their mind when something else does come up because the odds are is that uh, we are very actively hiring right now. Peak Performers has, I believe, over 80 positions for uh, temporary roles, but we also have multiple uh, openings internally as well. And if you talk to most organizations right now, they will tell you the same thing. They will tell you that we are very actively hiring. And so sometimes it's a bit like hitting a moving target, right? You know, you want that contract specialist job, but they just closed that contract specialist job. And now you're waiting for the next one. So 
seek to build relationships with the people that you talk to and the people that you interact with so that they can keep you in mind for multiple future other opportunities as well too. So having said that, I'm going to kind of stop my share and open it up for questions that you may have. Thank you all for uh, being so attentive. I do really appreciate that, but uh, I am open for any questions that may come up. All right, I'm checking, let's, let's check the chat and see if there are any questions. And as we're waiting for questions to come in, so Miles, um, how has networking changed in the age of COVID-19? <laughs> Uh, networking has changed a lot, uh, mainly in that most of us are doing our networking virtually right now. Uh, so I would say that before it was very plausible for you to be able to bump into most people that you might want to get to know. Um, and, uh, you know, you could use that and complement uh, your existing kind of outreach through LinkedIn networking, but also some strategic kind of targeting of people and things of that nature. Um, but most of it is going to be happening virtually right now. So I encourage you to use all the tools that are available to you um, to figure out how to get in touch with people and then figure out how to make it personable. Oftentimes we are desperately lacking that human touch of getting a chance to sit down with the niece and do coffee at our favorite coffee shop. Uh, and, you know, I miss that. I don't know about you, Denise, but I miss that. Right? <laughs> of so course, of how course. can we? How can we replicate that? How can we kind of do things like have a video chat, have spend 10, 15 minutes, you know, we'll both go to our independent coffee makers and stuff and have a coffee together. Okay. Um, there is, a, by the way, that's a deal. Uh, <laughs> there's a question here. Do these suggestions apply to full-time as well as part-time jobs? Uh, thank you for the question, Irene. Uh, that is a really good one. Um, they apply for pretty much all jobs. Uh, the majority of the jobs that are out there are going to be filled uh, via networking. And so we see it on kind of two different spectrums, right? So a lot of times for the full-time opportunities that are out there, it's going to be things like, hey, we need a developer analyst that is going to finally write this piece of code that we've been needing to write for the last 10 years or something like that, fill in the blank. Um, so they're oftentimes kind of filling in a very specific function. Um, Part-time roles, I would argue that oftentimes they are even more important that you network your way into because oftentimes the company may not completely have identified that they actually need this work done. So maybe you can use your way to kind of work them, uh, work into them and be able to say, hey, you know, I'd be available for, you know, some part-time uh, HR consulting work if, uh, if you guys do have something that comes up. Uh, and the more people that you know in the HR department, the more likely it is that they might actually utilize you for those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. In regards to building a LinkedIn profile, what if I'm worried about privacy? Good question. So in regards to privacy, um, obviously don't put your uh, basic kind of like... Um, Obviously, what you uh, you want to make sure that you don't put like your personal address or things of that nature on there, um, and be especially cognizant of this if you are uploading your resume directly to your LinkedIn profile, which yes is an option. Uh, so you can be kind of careful about doing that. Uh, there are some other things that you can do uh, if you are particularly and acutely worried about privacy. So say for example, instead of uh, uploading a picture of just you, which is what I normally recommend, you might include a picture with you with like two other colleagues or something look, uh, looking business formal or something. And that way they don't necessarily know who you are. So um, privacy is tricky uh, because um, the reality of it is, is that recruiters are going to be only be able to reach out to the people that want to be found. Um, but you also have to balance that with your own personal privacy level as well. Oh, that's good. Good answer. Good answer to that. Let's see what else. Well, another question is, should I apply through the company's website or on the job search platform? Job, yeah. So I often like to say, uh, why race one horse when you can race multiple different horses? Buy all the tickets that you possibly can, right? Um, and so what this means for job seekers is that, yes, I want you to continue to utilize all those different platforms where you can go to find jobs because, yes, the company has identified and they are willing to pay good money to find the right candidate for that job. So you should not discount that. Just realize that you're going to be competing against way many other people. So oftentimes what I encourage people to do is you can even kind of shortcut the process even a little bit and get your resume in that much faster into in front of the recruiters if you go and you see 
see a job that's posted on, say, for example, um, Indeed, and then you go directly to their website and you apply directly on their website. It's going to get to the recruiters a little bit faster. Okay. All right. Great. Let's see if there. Thought I saw someone typing there. Let's see. Uh, Miles, are there? Do you have any networking tips for older adults? Sure. So. When it comes to older adults and networking, um, I think that the biggest thing that I like to throw out there is that the world has changed a little bit and it might be a little bit different than expectations. So some of the people that might be on the call um, might be of the mind, uh, might remember the time when you could go and walk into a business and drop off your resume and actually get a job that way. Uh, the reality of it is, is that the world has changed. And most of the time, if you were to do that, uh, if anything, uh, you know, anything other than like, you know, dropping by a fast food joint where they are really desperate for people. Um, most of the time, that's probably not going to work. Uh, similarly, I'd encourage any older adults to just kind of um, check expectations and stuff and make sure that you are applying for the right kinds of roles too. So um, it can be, uh, I run into this an awful lot with older adults where they might uh, say, for example, to me that, um, you know, I, never had to apply for a job before. I was only able to just know somebody to know somebody. But if the recruiter tells you to apply online and then follow up through this particular course of action, make sure that you do that. Make sure that you do respect their processes and their kind of standards and procedures and that you are observant of whatever it is that they're expecting you to do. Okay. There's a question from Donna. Do private companies use a1 pre-screening like the job search sites, meaning do I have a better chance of getting past the A1 by applying directly to a private company? Um, good question, Donna. So uh, I think what you're talking about right there, and you can correct me in the chat if you're wrong, but I think you're talking about artificial intelligence or um, what are called applicant tracking systems. So, okay, I got a yes from there, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> Applicant tracking systems is, uh, and many of the job seekers that are on the call right now, they're probably cursing under their breath. They're going, applicant tracking systems. That's what keeps me from getting a job. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I hear your frustration. It is a technology that is out there uh, that exists primarily to be able to help companies um, be able to find people. Uh, because the reality of it is, is that even right now, when we exist in a world where we have a, an acute labor shortage um, that is out there and available for us. The reality of it is, is that applicant tracking systems is something that most intelligent companies are going to use. Uh, and oftentimes what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that you are interacting appropriately within that applicant tracking system. So if you're applying through Indeed, it's still going into the applicant tracking system. If you apply through their own person, their own website, it's still going to go into the applicant tracking system. And the whole point is for us to be able to treat all job seekers consistently and fairly fairly for everybody. So um, it still goes into an ATS, uh, but uh, you might be able to actually get in uh, front of the recruiter's eyes a little bit faster. Okay. There is a question from Elaine. For jobs, for jobs listed on the Peak Performers website, what is the process to follow? Absolutely. So you go and you apply for a particular position uh, that might be of interest to you. Um, and uh, if you see multiple positions that are a good fit for you, you can apply for a couple of those as well, too. It's going to ask you very simply to just upload some very basic kind of information, uh, as, such as your resume. Uh, we're not often asking for your cover letter. Uh, we're not often asking for a, a full-blown uh, um application yet. Uh, that happens a little bit later on in our process. All that we need is a resume. Now, what I will do is I'll include a link down here at the uh, at the end here. Don't let me forget, Denise, but uh, I will include a link right here for each of you to follow up with our recruiting team. Uh, and that is uh, going to be recruiter at peakperformers.org. Uh, and uh, you can also reach out to us directly via our phone number too, which is 512 453 8833. Uh, 
I encourage you to give us a call. You know, it's, uh, the reality of it is, is that many job seekers are afraid to follow up on their resume, but it can be that thing that sets you apart from all the other job seekers that are out there. If you take that time to follow up on your resume and seek to develop a relationship with the recruiter, we will seek to get in touch with each person that is qualified to do the job, because believe me, we want to put you to work, but there might also be a disconnect. So perhaps you applied for a job and you never got a call back from a recruiter at our company and you want to know why right? Many of you are feeling that way right now. I want to know why. I just want to be kind of let out of this black hole. So we try to do our best to at least kind of answer the phone and answer emails if a job seeker does specifically kind of follow up with us there. There's a question from Kurt. Any suggestions for introverted or shy individuals? <laughs> Kurt, I feel you, man. It's, uh, it's hard. Uh, it's... Um, Networking is hard. Uh, there, there's a reason that it, um, there's a reason that so many job seekers don't do it. And that's because it is scary. It's scary to put yourself out there and it's scary to kind of go out there and meet new people. But Kurt, if I could offer you one thing right there, uh, this is coming from somebody that previously was very shy. Uh, I've sought to kind of get over that, although I still have my shy moments, um, is that the worst that could happen is that they tell you no. Um, that's the worst that could happen. You know, the odds are, I like to assume that most people out there in the world are friendly, they are helpful, they are genuine human beings that just want to see other human beings to be successful and make a positive impact on the world. That's it, you know? Uh, so try to keep that in mind when you're approaching people and talking to people. Hey, assume that this person wants to help me or at least wants to try to connect with me. If they don't get back to me, maybe they're just too busy right now and that's okay. But um, it never hurts to do that reach out and talk to people. Donna has another question. Um, if you are unsure if your application made it past the ATS, is it ever appropriate to reach out? And if so, what would be the best method? Good question, Donna. And thank you for asking all these questions. I really do appreciate that. Um, so the best advice that I give to all job seekers is to follow the process and follow the rules of the road. Um, so if uh, it, but that said, you are given a lot of flexibility and a lot of opportunities to follow up on your resume. Um, so first off, uh, if a company does not want you to follow up on their uh, on your resume, odds are you probably will not be able to find contact information to get in touch with them in the first place. Okay, that's fine. Um, you know, we can just let that one lie and they can go and good luck. Uh, hopefully you can find some people and stuff. But a lot of times what you can do too is you can specifically go and you can call into the main line and ask to speak to the HR department and say, hey, uh, I was really excited about this particular job. Um, I wanted to follow up and just make sure that you guys got my resume. I'd love to chat with a recruiter about it. Again, there may be gatekeepers there that may not let you through, but it never hurts to ask. And most of the time they're going to let you through because again, we're in a hiring shortage right now. And most people get into the HR business because they want to help people. So, you know, you can uh, call them up, have a conversation and you can talk with them about that as well too. You can also follow up via email too. Uh, but here's my kind of number one tip is that if you have a rock star interview, which I know you're going to have this week, I know that you're going to have an amazing one. Um, what I'd encourage you to do as the very last question is say, hey, Denise, I feel like we had a really good connection right here. And I'm really excited about this opportunity. Is it okay if I follow up with you in two weeks from now to see where you're at in the hiring process? And odds are, if we actually did have a connection, you know, uh, Denise is going to say, yeah, that's totally fine for me. Um, and great, Denise, how can I get in touch with you to follow up with that? Uh, so we've built that human connection, we've built out our network, and we've already stood out above all the job seekers. And here's the best part, is that you no longer are in the dark. You don't know when Denise is going to get back to you, or if she's going to get back to you, you have an actionable step that you can take right there to follow up with Denise and talk with her about a job. Okay, I'm checking to see if Donna says thank you. <laughs> uh, we have uh, another one from Irene. If you are an older adult with many years of work experiences, should yeah. one include all of them or only, or only, only some of them? One? 
Yeah, I, I think X, I get the gist of that question. X the number, yeah. Yeah. Of, and, of X a number of years of <laughs> experience. So. And Irene, I think I take it that you're probably asking this question because you've been told multiple different things over the years. And uh, I hate to tell, but I tell you this, but I'm probably not going to be the authoritative source on this. I'm going to just offer you yet one more opinion. Um, the reality of it is, is that ageism is a very big problem uh, that many people face right there. And so a lot of people may uh, worry about ageism and seek to kind of curb that through doing things like appearing younger on their profile. Uh, say, for example, you may have heard the advice that, um, hey, I'm going to go and uh, um, only post the last 10 years of experience uh, for this particular job that I'm applying for. It always depends. There is no single answer to this question right here. Uh, you have to kind of know what you're getting into. So say, for example, if you're applying for a public sector company, uh, oftentimes they want to see all of your experience. Uh, we still get requests for people that have experience programming in something called COBOL. And the reality of it is, is that most IT people out there are probably groaning right now because they're like, COBOL? I remember doing that back in the 90s. But the reality of it is, is that, um, you know, you have to know the organization, have to know what they're looking for. So for our particular purposes, we like to see all the experience clearly laid out and that actually works to your benefit. But let's say you are working, uh, uh, trying to apply for a job at a new startup and you are concerned about ageism uh, and you are concerned about them screening you out uh, for that particular reason. First off, they absolutely should not be doing that. But I understand where that might be coming from. Uh, a lot of times it might also come in the form of you're overqualified for this particular position, right? So if you think that that is the case, my general guidance is to offer the last 10 years of work experience that you have. And then uh, as an additional kind of element that you can do is you can, at the bottom of your resume, you can put additional work experiences and just not list the date. You can also just be careful about doing things like listing when you graduated from college or high school in order to not, um, not uh, age yourself uh, on the resume. Alma, I am so sorry to hear this, but uh, Alma has a question. She says her internet went out. Can you repeat tips <laughs> five and six? <laughs> uh, what I could do is, uh, I, I don't know, we have about three minutes left, so uh, that might be a little tricky. Let me go back. Uh, Okay, and I can share this uh, share this whole presentation uh, via PDF. To, and you can can you send that out to everybody, Denise? Denise, are you You're there? Muted, Denise. Huh? Denise is muted. I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you make sure that we um, have the presentation, and I'll be happy to send it out. We'd be happy to send it out. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, but. Uh, tips number five was watch for opportunities. So that's where you're going and you're finding uh, people within the network and you are actively looking on their job site, but you're also looking for things like, hey, did they move on from a company or are they advertising on their LinkedIn profile that they're looking for a particular job? And my number six tip was uh, don't treat a no as a no, treat no as a, can I get to maybe with this one? Uh, don't ever kind of shut down uh, from uh, any particular thing. Use every no that you have as an opportunity to build a relationship for a possible future opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Alma. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, I didn't go on mute this time in case I forgot to unmute myself again. Well, we are coming to the close. We have about two more minutes. If there are um, any other questions and Miles, you had asked me if I would remind you, please, to include the link. Um, yes, that so with the I will do that right now and okay. everybody you can either save the chat I believe or you can just copy paste from this right here again I try to be uh, I'm not a recruiter believe it or not I actually don't spend that much time actually looking at candidate profiles right there but I'm happy to connect with you on LinkedIn especially if you maybe only have five connections or something right now I am happy to be your sixth connection. Connect with me. You know, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to um, help kind of help you grow your own personal network right here. And we do post a lot of jobs. Elena says you're the best, Miles. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, Kurt. Donna, good to see you. Charlie, good to see you. Great.
Well, we are at 2.59. We've got less than a minute and I wanted to once again say thank you, Miles, for a wonderful presentation. Very interesting, very informative. And I also wanted to thank the participants for, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for your very thoughtful questions. They were um, mind evoking and we appreciate so much uh, your attendance and your interests in our uh, job fairs. Uh, we hope that you will continue to join us in the future. Miles, we hope to have you back again in 2022. Uh, I'll be here, I'm, I'm happy to come back. <laughs> I personally would like to wish on behalf of Austin Up and everyone, happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays and be safe. Happy holidays, everybody, bye-bye. Thank you.